Hi there. My name is Noah Lefebvre, and I am a content creator. Like many in my field, I kind of detest that label, and particularly the word content. It's a word that feels empty to me. It's a word that's tied up with the vapid tech bro lingo of billion dollar platforms. A word that conjures to mind an endless output of sludge, optimized to serve an algorithm that exists to feed the engine of capital. I've always felt that it suggests that the work that my peers and I create exists not for entertainment, inspiration, or education, but rather for the sole purpose of being consumed. It's a word that cheapens the care, thought, and labor that we put into our work. Now, I will grant that my interpretation of the phrase might be a little dramatic, but I don't think it's that far off from how a lot of us feel. So many creators that I know have such a strong desire for their work to be seen as something more than content. We want our work to be seen and understood as art. This art versus content divide is something that's talked about a lot in creative spaces, and something that I've spent way too much time thinking about. It's a divide at the center of an identity crisis that I've been having for at least a year now, if not longer. Because the reality is that despite years of trying to push back against the drive for content, trying to defy the algorithm and create my work my way, I don't get to define how the world sees me or my profession. Whether I like it or not, I am a content creator. So as of today, I am officially resigning myself to this reality. That doesn't mean I'm going to start putting out mindless sludge, but it does mean that the shape of this channel is going to change. Hell, just the fact that you're seeing me talk right now is a pretty big change. I don't entirely know what the rest of the changes for this channel are going to look like, but I'm hoping that through this video, I'll be able to come up with some answers. So join me, if you will, as I interrogate my own changing philosophy on art and content, and let's see if I can't find a way to reconcile these concepts to create a better professional future for myself, and a better future for Polyphonic. Let's take a closer look. When it comes to the discussion of art versus content, there's a tendency to view them as antithetical opposites. In this worldview, art can be read as a pure representation of the creative drive, people expressing the human experience openly and honestly without caring about what audiences or critics think. On the other hand, content is empty and cynical, made for commercial appeal to appease the masses and sell products. While the concept of content is intrinsically tied to the digital age, there's a lot of historical echoes in this sort of debate. It was the driving ethos behind the punk scenes of the 80s who viewed their work as true expressions of raw human emotion, created in direct contradiction to the crisp commercial rock of the era. Even earlier, those same concepts reared their head in the Greenwich Village folk revival, who saw a nobility in their approach to music that was lacking in the pop music of their day. Really, it's not hard to see why this worldview has an appeal. It allows for an easy othering of media that people don't like, allowing them to claim it as commercial, claim that its creators are sellouts and reinforce a perceived superiority. I know that in the past I've definitely fallen into this trap, thinking that my refusal to play the algorithmic games separated my work from other content and made me special. But the reality is a little more complicated than that. In the modern age, very few people make art without thinking of an audience that might want to see it, and I think that even a lot of the most cynical content creators do truly put a piece of themselves in their work. I often think of a Paul McCartney quote from a Rolling Stone interview where he talks about the Beatles' writing process. John and I literally used to sit down and say, now let's write a swimming pool. If we view the world in a sort of black and white art versus content way, this would seem to suggest that a lot of the Beatles' work could maybe be categorized as content. Now, I recognize that the music industry of the 60s is not the same as the content industry now, but I think the comparison is apt. And I think that's why I tend to think of the art versus content divide more as a spectrum. Within this theory of media, art and content are not categories, but rather representations of forces that pull on artists. 
I call these the creative and the consumptive force. The creative force represents the desire for self-expression and the desire to build on and interface with the broader canon of human creativity, while the consumptive force represents the desire to have your work consumed by an audience. With the way that art industries work in the modern age, that often means playing up the commerciality to appeal to networks of distribution. So I think it's just as apt to call this the commercial force. These forces are both tugging on artists at all times, and the strength of each pull determines the character of the work in question. If we apply this theory to the Beatles' work, we'll see that their career is actually pretty spread out along the spectrum. Something like I Want to Hold Your Hand is a piece that has a strong commercial pull, using known tropes and song forms to create a radio hit. Meanwhile, Revolution 9 is a piece that falls almost all the way on the creative side as a deeply experimental song. In between are myriad songs like Norwegian Wood, a relatively simple pop song with a bit of experimentation, or Strawberry Fields Forever, a song with catchy commercial hooks, but deeply experimental music and personal lyrics. I think this is the start of a solid framework to analyze art of all sorts. Let's look at something more modern and try out my own videos. I definitely have some works that are more experimental or personal, like my pieces on Buddy Bolden, Degraded Media, or Joni Mitchell and the Melancholy of Christmas. But also, long before I ever acknowledged my work as content, I was making works that had a purely commercial drive. My entire series cover stories was specifically designed to be something I could pump out easily with minimal effort and not have to worry about fighting copyright for the monetization. Most of the time that I do a dad rock video these days, it's because I'm trying to appeal to a core audience and bring in some more money. Does this make me a sellout? It's possible, and I'll take that criticism if some of you want to call me that. But also, this is my job. This is how I pay bills. I started Polyphonic because of a passion for music and for online video, and that creative drive does sometimes win out. But just as often, I am making videos because of the commercial drive. When I first started Polyphonic seven years ago, I didn't really think of the channel as art at all. That only came as I dedicated more time to making videos and learned more about motion design. I became more experimental visually, more interested in pushing the bounds of my medium, and more able to express myself through my work. But at the beginning, I also didn't really think of my work purely as content. The commercial pull was definitely there, I had designs on making some money someday, but there was a third pull on me as a creative, a pull that I often think gets lost in these art versus content debates. When I first started Polyphonic, I was just a year out of journalism school, and that deeply informed my motivations and the way I designed my channel. I believed that my channel could be used to educate people, and to help improve the world in my own small way, and I still believe that. And I think that's an incredibly common drive for creative individuals. I've started to think of this third force as the civic force, the pull to improve the world through your work. If we want to use music as an example, I think the civic force is heavy in a lot of political punk or hip hop. It's the drive to create art that improves your culture and benefits the world around you. But I don't think it needs to be a political thing. In the world of digital media, this is the main driving force behind a lot of educational YouTubers. It's definitely the drive behind a lot of my work. Videos like my queer history of disco, my video on the devil and the crossroads, or my video on the protest music of Hong Kong all have a strong civic pull. Thinking within this three-point framework has helped me gain a better understanding of myself as a creator, and of the broader creative world. It's helped me realize that art and content are not mutually exclusive categories, and that both can be used simultaneously to great effect. And it's also helped me gain a better understanding of my own trajectory as a creator. In my early days, much of my work sat over here, heavily influenced by the civic and commercial poles. But as I became a better editor and learned new ways of expressing myself through my videos, the creative tug pulled on me more and more. And in a vacuum, this shift would have been fine. I could have just switched to doing more esoteric stuff and gone about my merry way. Only I don't create in a vacuum. I create on a platform. And that platform impacts the shape of my art. Over the seven years that I've been making YouTube videos, the nature of YouTube has shifted drastically. 
the direct relationship between creator and audience has been thrown out the window in favor of algorithmically driven recommendations. Where you used to be able to carve out a niche audience and connect them through the subscriber box, you now need to play to an algorithm that prioritizes keeping people on the platform above all else. And this shift has changed the makeup of pressures on the creator. The commercial pressure, the pressure to conform to the algorithm, has amped up drastically. And this means that in order to play the game and have a living on YouTube, creators like myself need to give in more and more to the commercial pressure. The result is a powerful shift toward the world of content. So we've established that art and content are not mutually exclusive, and that content might be seen as media created with a strong commercial pull. But we haven't actually talked that much about the specific character of content. Because I do think that there are things that differentiate modern online content from, say, the commercial pop music of the 60s, specifically in the character of its media. Just as the sound of 60s pop was molded by the radio, the feel of 2020s content is molded by the media platforms that host it. Specifically, modern online video is shaped by recommendation algorithms. This is evident from the surface level. It's the reason why so many YouTube thumbnails feel the same, and why there's a few syntax trends that you'll see in video titles, especially within niche communities. But it runs deeper than just packaging. Over the past four years or so, we've seen video essay lengths skyrocket. When I first started my channel, some video essayists, like myself, were nervous about pushing videos past 10 or 15 minutes. Today, video essays will regularly sprawl for two to three hours, if not longer. This is a direct result of an algorithm that disproportionately rewards watch time because it wants people to stay on the platform as long as possible. The algorithm bumps videos that run longer, which in turn encourages creators to make longer videos. The result is a positive feedback loop. Even the content that creators talk about is driven by platforms. YouTube's advertiser policies around so-called controversial issues make it a lot harder for creators to talk about subjects like sex, drugs, queer issues, or honestly, even just world history. Now, this might sound like I'm gearing up for a Nebula ad read, and this video is sponsored by Nebula, but Nebula is a platform just the same as YouTube. It's not exempt from this reality. Nebula has its own guiding culture and principles that shape the look and feel of Nebula content, just as YouTube or Twitch or TikTok do. All platforms shape the nature of their content. I support Nebula because it tries to shape things with the consent of the creators and not by kowtowing to advertising influences, but it still shapes things. For much of my career, I have deliberately fought back against the ways that YouTube influences online content. I tried to approach my videos with the sort of objectivity and rigor that I learned in journalism school. That meant I tried to make my scripts lean and tight, because journalism is all about the economy of words. It meant I separated myself from the video, speaking as a disembodied voice of authority. It meant that I opted away from clickable thumbnails, trying instead to make beautiful images that were an aesthetic preview of what was to come in the video. And above all else, to my core, I always believed that I was working in a visual medium, which meant that whatever was on screen needed to look beautiful, or at least interesting. That last one was so intrinsically tied to the core of what Polyphonic is. And for a while, it helped differentiate me, helped me get a loyal following, and helped me express myself in exciting ways. But that's slowed down in recent years. My sort of content just isn't holding up to the algorithm anymore. As there's a push for longer content or personality-driven shorts, I feel as though I've fallen to the wayside. It's incredibly difficult to put out longer videos that are entirely labor-intensive motion design, and it's against my every instinct to ramble and go needlessly in-depths on a topic. But that's what the platform wants. It wants video essays that are second screen, things to be watched in the background as viewers do chores or fall asleep. I never wanted my videos to be that. I always wanted my videos to be so stunning that they demanded your full attention. Of course, they never were. I'm sure many of you have watched my videos in the background, or while falling asleep, or without even really taking much account for the visuals. 
and you're not wrong to. All these years, while trying to build something to the standards of my journalistic ideals, I had been forgetting one of the first things they teach you in first-year communication studies. The medium is the message. In 1964, a Canadian communications theorist named Marshall McLuhan published a book called Understanding the Media, The Extensions of Man. Written in the middle of a wave of mass media explosion, this book posited a radical idea that the message being sent through any medium is less important than the nature of the medium sending the message. McLuhan discusses both the ways that different forms of media shape society and the ways that different forms of media shape their own content. The latter discussions are what's really relevant to the topic today. That's what I'm talking about when I say that radio shaped popular music in the 60s, or that platforms like TikTok, YouTube, or Nebula are changing the nature of the creator's content, and the nature of their relationship to their audience. In Understanding Media, McLuhan explains that the content of each medium is always another medium. Now, I recognize this might be a little difficult to follow because McLuhan talks about the content of media, and I'm talking about online content. So for this section, when I say the content, I'm going to mean the specific message carried by a medium. And when I say online content, I'm going to mean the medium of online content, i.e. what you're watching now. In McLuhan's age, radio was one of the dominant media technologies. The content often carried by this technology was music, itself a form of media. Make sense? I hope so, because I'm going to keep going. The way that I see it, online content is itself a medium. The content that online content carries, in my case, is video. And that's where the mistake in my creative philosophy came in. I wanted to make work that properly used its own medium. But I was viewing my medium as video, not as online content. That might seem like a small or insignificant change, but really it's everything. It means the whole time I was focusing way too hard on my message and how audiences would interact with it while completely overlooking the ways audiences might interact with the medium of online content. It doesn't matter if I try to use a journalistic voice or if I try to make my visuals as compelling as possible because I'm still working in the medium of online content. This means my work will be intrinsically shaped by the rules and conventions of that medium. And it means my audience will interact with me as a content creator. So I think it's time for me to reluctantly accept that mantle. Okay, so here I am. Still polyphonic, but also Noah. I'm going to embrace the realities of being a content creator and try my best to create for this medium. And if I'm going to do that, I need to break down this distance that I've cultivated over the past seven years. One of the defining features of online content is the centering of the creator. There are definitely exceptions where creators have maintained distance or anonymity, but by and large, creators thrive as much because of who they are as because of their content. That's kind of always been true online, but it's become more and more true in recent years as platforms have leaned into fostering their own micro-celebrity talents. In the early days of the channel, I quite deliberately avoided this creator-centric view. Part of this reason was my journalistic background, which had taught me to remove myself from the story. I wanted to be an objective observer, not part of the story itself. But I could never truly remove myself from the story because... I'm not objective. My personal tastes, my cultural history, my political views, all these things inevitably bleed through in my content. And I began to watch other creators who inserted themselves into their video essays and created really powerful work by doing so. All this was happening as that creative drive was pulling harder and harder on me, so every now and then I decided to slip bits of myself into my videos. The result is some of the best work I've ever done, at least in my opinion. Still, despite these successes, I was wary to go on camera and wary to share more about Noah. I liked the comfort and safety in hiding behind the polyphonic voice. And beyond that, I didn't want to feed into the dangerous culture of parasocial relationships. 
In case you're unfamiliar with the concept, a parasocial relationship is a relationship where one party is emotionally invested in another party that is basically unaware of their existence. They tend to happen with celebrities and creatives, athletes, musicians, and maybe most of all, content creators. These parasocial relationships are not inherently bad. They're sort of a natural fact of mass media. Humans are social creatures. If someone's work touches us, it's only natural that we'll start to feel a sort of closeness to them. I myself have parasocial relationships with creators that I watch, musicians that I love, authors that influence me. And chances are, if you're watching this video, you have some semblance of a parasocial relationship to me. The problems start when fans become too obsessive over parasocial relationships, when these false, one-sided interactions are replacing real, substantive human contact. That becomes exacerbated when platforms encourage creators to lean into parasocial relationships. And platforms are definitely doing this. It's why YouTube tells you to create names for your fan base. It's why so much of the language of content creators is direct and personal. It's why I'm addressing this directly to you. I've always been very wary about parasocial relationships. If you want to better understand why, Shannon Strucci's incredible series, Fake Friends, explores in far more depth than I ever possibly could. But the long and short of it is that when people fall too deeply into parasocial relationships, things get weird and sometimes even dangerous for creators and for audiences. It can collapse people's social lives, it can lead to financial exploitation, and in the worst scenarios, it can lead to obsessive fans harming other people, or even harming the celebrities they love. One of the expectations the world has for content creators is for us to always be reaching out and building an imagined community with our fans. And it sounds good, but honestly, I think it can be used in incredibly cynical ways. So I want to be clear here. I don't know you. I appreciate that you follow my channel and like my work, but frankly, the concept of having fans like this terrifies me. You terrify me. If I had things my way, I would probably not ever really go on camera and make myself vulnerable like this. I would love to just throw videos into the void and never have to interact with the online world again. But that's not the reality of my chosen profession, of my chosen art. At the start of this year, I took a hiatus because I was severely burnt out on Polyphonic. I pushed myself incredibly hard last year. I started the year off finishing off Polyphonic Magazine, my intensive original series. I created Axe to Grind, my most ambitious Polyphonic series to date. I wrote an entire book, and I did all this while moving across the country. By the end of last year, I genuinely didn't know if I could handle making content again. So I took some time to travel, I took some time to think, and I took some time to work on other projects. I explored options for potential career paths beyond content. I tried to ignore the commercial pull, and I tried to imagine a world where I could indulge my own creativity. I leaned into making more visual art, some of which is behind me now. I worked on my novel, which I'm still actively seeking an agent for, and I worked on some other projects that are still in development. But through all this, I kept finding myself having to make content again. The way that you make living as a creative in the modern world isn't by making art. It's by making content about making art. The way that you find success as an author is through self-promotion online, by creating parasocial relationships to sell your work. In the modern age, creative professions have become inseparable from content creation. And so I realized that if I want to do what I want to do, I need to embrace being a content creator. I need to embrace being a public figure. And honestly, the best place to do that is right here. So here I am, Noah Lefebvre, content creator. When I was writing this script, I only had vague ideas of what this meant for the future of the channel. I think there's a temptation to declare, this is a new era, and say everything's going to change, but the reality is that this is just the latest step in an ongoing transformation of who I am and what this channel is. I'll still be doing the typical polyphonic content that you love, but I'm also opening myself up to possibilities of what the future could look like. 
I'm going to stop trying to force my channel to be something that it's not. And I'm going to stop trying to hide Noah away. This doesn't mean I'm going to ignore the creative pull or the civic pull, but it does mean that I might allow the commercial pull to influence me a bit more. I don't think I'll devolve into full clickbait stuff, but you're probably going to see more casual content. I might do some album reviews, some more personal, opinion-based videos like some I tried last fall. I might even do shorter, lower-effort rants, because I have a lot of thoughts that I like sharing. I might even start live-streaming again, and maybe even start using this platform to interview musicians. I don't really know, but... I'll definitely be talking to you more about the other projects that I'm working on. One of those is Century of Song, my book. If you want to read it, you can find it wherever books are sold September 17th. See, I'm already selling out. Really, I don't know what the shape of Polyphonic is going to look like, but I know this moment is long overdue. So join me for the ride if you want to. And now that I've officially embraced my role as content creator... I can finally say, smash that like button and give me a subscribe if you like what I do. Okay, that felt dirty. I'm never saying that again. But hey, if you do want to support my channel, you can check out Nebula. Nebula is a platform that is genuinely trying to push the bounds of what online content can be. They want to give creators commercial support that allows us to flex our creative drives. And they do that by funding the creation of incredible originals, like my own Polyphonic Magazine, which was an experiment in form unlike anything I'd ever done before. Lately, Nebula has been helping creators jump the gap from nonfiction to fiction content, supporting original works by the likes of Patrick H. Willems, Abigail Thorne, and Jesse Gender, and there's a lot more to come on the horizon. If you want to watch any of these or help support their creation, you can sign up using my link at nebula.tv polyphonic or by clicking the link below. Using that link will help support me and get you 40% off an annual plan. Or if you've got a bit more spare cash and really want to support this new vision for a creative ecosystem, you could sign up for a lifetime subscription. For $300, you have guaranteed access to Nebula for as long as you exist and as long as the platform exists. The money from these lifetime subscriptions goes directly toward funding exciting new original content, meaning you're playing a clear role in the creation of dream projects for creators like me. So check it all out now with the link in the description. And hey, thanks for watching.